All right, Steph, thank you so much. It is time now for our weekly check-in with the mayor. A lot to discuss here. We'll get right to it. Mayor John Tory joins us live now. Good morning to you, Mayor. Morning, Mel. Uh, I want to begin with uh, what has happened overnight. Unfortunately, we've seen uh, yet another night of violence here in the city of Toronto. Three separate shootings, uh, six separate victims. Um, and uh, just looking at a tweet from the Toronto Police Association saying Tor Toronto is on track to beat last year's record-setting number of shootings. I, I know this is at the top of your list as well for something that we do need to tackle in the city. Your response to some of the violence we've seen as of late. Well, it's unacceptable, but I also think people understand there's no easy answer to it. Uh, the new uh, police chief, the interim police chief, Jim Raymer, has redeployed some assets and has his own strategy, which he presented to the police board uh, earlier this week to uh, deal with it. Uh, we know that we have to make uh, more investments in the community uh, to address some of the root causes, and we know we need some help with the law. Uh, you know, the law, when it uh, has to do with bail and people out on firearms charges, uh, even some of the gun laws are in need of, uh, you know, further uh, strengthening and, and uh, tightening. And I think that these are things that are in the domain of the other governments, but it's things we've been advocating for. So uh, it's just one of those things where I, I, I know people understand that I can't sit here and say there is a magic answer because if there was one, uh, we would have implemented it by now. It's a very tough issue involving gangs and drugs and human trafficking and uh, very complicated. And we're doing, uh, the, the police are doing their best to try and deal with it, but there's much more to be done. Let's talk a little bit about some issues that continue to plague us here on our streets. 130 suspected overdoses in Toronto so far this year, looking to some funding to help curb the ongoing opioid crisis. Uh, where do things stand right now? I know you're looking at all levels of government to help out here. Well, they stand in a place that is completely inadequate. And I've said this for a couple of years now. You know, it's interesting. The federal and provincial government signed an agreement, which was, should have been a very heartening uh, thing, on mental health and addictions for billions of dollars to be spent in a five-year period. And I said directly to the prime minister, as I've, as I've done to the provincial ministers, that it's hard to know where that money is going because what it's not going to is the kinds of treatment programs that we need. We had 27 people die from drug overdoses in the city of Toronto in the month of July. This is not acceptable. This is preventable loss of life. Um, and this is loss of life on a scale that is way in excess of what we see from pedestrian deaths, which we're fighting hard to get down, and the same with homicide. So uh, it's one of those things where we need more treatment programs. We need more uh, harm reduction to be funded as opposed to cut back. And it's one of those things where the city cannot do it on its own. It's really a part of the health care system, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. It's mental health, um, no different than kidney health or heart health or lung health. So uh, I, we need more help in that regard because right now these people are dying and they're dying unnecessarily. Indeed, it is a crisis. I want to get the latest now when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, in your press conference yesterday, talking about the, that age of the those infected, the average age now sitting at 39 in the last couple of weeks, I think that number will be surprising for a lot of people. And so the city of Toronto looking to maybe uh, join alongside some social media platforms. And this is getting a lot of traction on our site here about the use of possibly TikTok. Do you, do you have a direction on what could, how this could all play out? Well, I'm not an expert on this, just like I'm not an expert on medicine and the things that relate to the spread of COVID. But I do know that what's at COVID, what I do know is what's happening is that I think a lot of young people are of the view, and I know this from talking to them, that they are sort of immortal or that they're invincible uh, from the virus. And the fact is that uh, they do suffer fewer instances of hospitalization. There are fewer deaths uh, from getting COVID among younger people. But, and this is the big, uh, you know, big qualifier, those very same young people go home to what are often multi-generational families, especially with housing prices the way they are in Toronto, where they live with parents and grandparents. And so what they become is a spreader uh, of the virus, uh, even if it doesn't take a huge toll on their own health, and sometimes they don't even know they have it. And so we've simply got to uh, do a better job educating, and that then causes you to look at uh, ways I wouldn't fully understand uh, as to how uh, people get their information, because right now I'm not sure that they're, you know, watching, uh, you know, all news uh, programs or things like that and they've got to be reached in a different way so we're going to do everything we can to get that message across that they too have to follow the same health protocols as everybody else wash your hands wear a face covering stay away from crowds physically distance um, you know and so on stay mm -hmm. home if you're sick if you have any symptoms uh, so so this is what we're going to have to do when we look at the young people we are two weeks away from potentially the first day of school. We'll be finding out what's happening with the TDSB a little bit later on today. I know the city has put forth and come up with some recommendations on various locations that could be used if we do need to move to the smaller class sizes, like some outside spaces, maybe libraries. Is there any progress on that front? And when the TDSB does come up with something today, will you be looking at even more possible locations? 
Well, that is a possibility. I mean, if they came back to us and said, well, this is very nice, what we were able to come up with, uh, but we need more, that's a possibility. And, of course, you know that we have to deal with two big school boards and a couple of smaller ones, but there are two big school boards, the Catholic and the public. But what the city did really as a proactive gesture that I asked be done about a month ago to be helpful was to simply compile a list of public spaces, community centers, libraries that could be more easily made available without huge interference with the programs we have going on in those spaces for seniors and for kids and otherwise. And so we came up with a list. We put it in front of the two school boards and said, this is what we can come up with as a first attempt. Uh, let us know if this is helpful. Because I just really think right now, we need everybody to cooperate. Uh, it is a close time between now and when school goes back. We need everybody to cooperate. The teachers, the uh, school boards, the province, the city, uh, public health people to, you know, get the kids back to school. Because they need to be back to school for the sake of their own mental health and their own well-being. So uh, that's why we put that forward. And uh, we'll see where those uh, talks go. Uh, we've been in discussions with the school boards. And we will do whatever we can that's feasible to help them. Yeah, I think there's a lot to come in the next even day or so. Uh, finally, I want to get your thoughts on the Raptors, two and two. Uh, we're we're no, doing two well. Two and zero. Two Mel. and zero. Don't, don't well, I say two and two, two in the two games two played. Two and two will win. never happen. That doesn't even. That doesn't yeah. sound like. You're two right. Games, two, two and zero. Oh. That's two right. Two and zero. Oh. Uh, message for our, for our Raptors. Just keep doing what you're doing. You know, this was the team at the beginning of this season that they said, you know, oh, well, they all fade into obscurity and that championship was some sort of a fluke. And they played with their hearts uh, all the way through. They played like a championship team and they've continued to do that after the pandemic break. And uh, I think maybe what we saw with some justice for Mr. Ujuri yesterday, mm -hmm. Masai, um, helped them to, uh, you know, because they started off a bit slow in the second game. Uh, so two more and uh, they'll be on to the next round. And uh, I think this team has uh, has what it takes to, uh, to do it, what we need to see done and maybe show some of those folks out of the border that uh, we're not to be uh, trifled with here. No, absolutely. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Masai Ujiri. You said justice, but but it, it's far from over, unfortunately. And it is oh, it's a true, major injustice. Think, yeah, it's true. But I think we have some justice now in the sense that at least another side of the story has been put. Mm -hmm. I said way back at the time it happened uh, that, you know, this man was incapable of that sort of behavior. I mean, he, he is one of our finest and best people. I mean, he's just a person who, you know, at all times is a first-rate ambassador for our city and for himself. And so you just knew that this video was lurking somewhere. And thank goodness we can now see what really went on. And uh, I just hope down there they uh, have the gumption to deal with this officer who clearly has some trouble with the truth. Yeah, let's really hope they do. Uh, last thing that we heard was that they weren't. They were standing by him. But uh, time will tell. We'll continue to follow the story. Mayor Tory, as always, great to talk to you. Thanks, Mel.